Hi. So recently on the QBath forums, there's been a few posts relating to the processing of spatial transcriptomics data. However, the posts themselves are generally you know, not worded in terms of spatial transcriptomics analysis. So QPath is basically a digital pathology platform, which I'm sure anyone watching this video is already quite aware of this. And spatial transcriptomics lies kind of on the edge of both single cell RNA sequencing fields and uh, digital pathology fields. So it would make sense that people looking for a method for analyzing spatial transcriptomics data who have a background in histology uh, processing or digital pathology would most likely come across QPath and try and find some kind of way to make use of it. Now, this forum poster, Pavel Senin, actually, despite calling himself a noob, has done an amazing job implementing Voroni tessellations um, in Visium HE images. Uh, so what this essentially does is if you provide a list of uh, coordinates for where the Visium spots uh, should be located, you can then dilate these spots until you reach the border of another spot. And by having a uh, Verona tessellation of a staggered grid of points, you essentially have these hexagonal-like structures. Now, I was kind of, well, interested, I guess you could say, as to why these shapes, why hexagonal structures. Um, and I don't know if it's actually mentioned in this post. Um, here it is. What I'm trying to do, am I sharing my screen? I hope I have. Uh, what I'm trying to do is achieve, is to count cells within proximity of a visium spot from which sequencing was obtained. I have an image by itself and can annotate cells on it and have a set of spot coordinates. What is left is, is to get a tessellation for better visualization and, or analysis. So, uh, let me just quickly pull that up again. The spots are not as packed up in reality um, as you know shown here. In fact, if you zoom in, you can see that the actual loose outline of the spots is in this kind of faint circle inside of them. And there's quite a lot of space between spots. Um, in fact, if I open the loop browser, which is kind of just a free 10x tool for, you know, quickly looking at um, Visium data, and, you know, I zoom into a tissue section, there is a lot of empty spots or empty space uh, around the spots. I believe this current version of Visium has uh, spots with a 50 micrometer diameter. Actually, I can just verify that by holding the scale bar up to it. Uh, actually, I think it was 55 micrometer diameter and 110 center to center distance. Yeah, seems about right. Um, meaning you can't or you shouldn't necessarily use a Veroni tessellation to infer whether or not a cell will land in the spot. Because, well, as you can clearly see, there are a lot of cells that will lie outside of a spot, and consequently, its genetic information, or rather transcriptomic information, may or may not um, be incorporated into the individual spot itself. So what I mean by that is, just because a cell is outside of a spot doesn't necessarily mean its genetic makeup is not going to, sorry, transcriptomic makeup is not going to influence the reads in that spot. For example, let's say you have a spot or you have a cell right here. Well, you have a little bit of cytoplasm around that and around that cytoplasm, you have a bunch of mRNAs kind of lingering around until they get, get processed by a ribosome and turn into a protein. The problem with this is even though it's outside of a spot, it actually may uh, give transcriptomic information that ends up getting sequenced. Now, why is that the case? Well, to understand that, we must understand how Visium actually operates. Um, here, I can pull up one of their user guides and hopefully it'll have a nice figure outlining how the process works. Um, well, okay, I'll, I'll try and use this and uh, 
explain it as best as I can. A tissue section is basically pla uh, placed on a glass slide. Well, not just any glass slide, a glass slide with these spots. Now, every single spot will have various parts to it. There'll be this true seek read one, which I'm not quite sure what it does. Maybe it makes it uh, readable by Illumina sequencers or whatever. A spatial barcode. So all spots or all um, oligonucleotides of a spot will have that same barcode. And a barcode is basically a unique set of oligonucleotides that yields a known spatial coordinate. So this is basically like um, if you have A, A, T, G, C, that'll translate to um, position 10, 30 or whatever on the slide. So as a result, all oligonucleotides up that spot will have the same barcode. Now, the unique molecular identifier will differ from each uh, oligonucleotide within a spot as well as uh, two other spots. And that helps essentially give a one-to-one -one kind of match between a captured mRNA and uh, well, a unique read or whatever the proper term is. And then finally, we have the uh, poly D VN or whatever. I don't know much or uh, poly DT. So I don't know much about what this actually stands for, but I'm looking here. There's a sub thymidine or thymine, whatever the thing is. I always mix up the monomers and whatever. Anyways, um, it will hybridize, or rather, yeah, hybridize to a poly adenosine or adenine. I always mix those two up. Poly D will bind to the poly A tail of mature mRNA is what I'm trying to say. Um, poly A tails are typically added to increase mRNA shelf life, and it's just a standard thing done to most protein coding uh, mRNAs. So you can safely say that um, this assay will capture any transcript um, that contains a poly A tail, and more often than not, those are protein coding transcripts. But I still haven't answered how do you actually go from a tissue section and take those RNAs and go onto the slide. Well, that's where we use permeabilization. So we basically um, put a buffer on your tissue that permeabilizes the cell. It disrupts the phospholipid bilayer. And as a result, mRNA inside of the cell will start diffusing out. Now here's the key word, diffuse. Diffusion is not going to happen in one direction, the one direction that we want, which is, you know, from the tissue to the slide in a straight line. That ha can happen, sure, but you also have lateral diffusion across pretty much any angle. Um, I mean, it'll diffuse according to the concentration gradient, and, well, your oligonucleotide sequence could travel a small but nonetheless significant distance, meaning... If you had a cell right outside a spot, but you permeabilized it and your transcripts were starting to flow onto the kind of sandwiched uh, visium slide underneath it, well, you actually can have spots outside of, or cells outside of a spot conferring transcriptomic information and influencing what reads show up in the spot. Now, uh, as of the second quarter of 2022, Visium did say they were supposed to release a Visium HD version, which basically means smaller spots and more packed up against one another. I'm a little bit skeptical to how well this works unless they have an adequate explanation for how they address the um, lateral diffusion issue. And if you want to see how big of an issue this is, uh, just look at some of the earlier slide seek papers. It's not pretty. <laughs> I mean, thankfully, SlideSeq did address these issues in a very creative manner, um, but sadly, it's not a commercially available modality. And unless you want to spend years of your life trying to basically replicate um, a flow cell microscopy setup with all the other sequencing things necessary, uh, the Zim is kind of the only option out there for commercially viable spatial transcriptomic solutions. So before I start rambling on for too long, let me see if I've actually answered the question that I originally set out to answer. Um, this one, 
I wonder about your comment about spot spacing and Voronoi-based boundaries, how the underlying technology mechanically works. Does it sequence whatever tissue is over the spot, or is there some known vicinity to sequencing uh, is applied? So <laughs> I hope that's actually answered your question. Um, there is a unknown distance around individual spots that cells can confer genetic information to. Maybe there's a study out there that addressed um, how far transcripts can be used laterally. And again, I would point to the slide seek paper but that can be influenced by so many other factors, uh, permeabilization time, tissue thickness, um, certain uh, extracellular proteins in the tissue that uh, hinder mRNA diffusion. So there is a vicinity, but it's not known. <laughs> um, so that's actually why I was kind of surprised with the use of Voronoi boundaries, because, you know, you, you can't really assume that spots are pressed up against one another and then all cells will directly incorporate their transcriptomics information to one spot or another. Very well, if you have a cell that just, I don't know, lies in between the two, like this one, is it going to end up in this spot or this spot or neither? Eh, we have no way of knowing. Um, I mean, not no way of knowing, but no way that I... I'm not intending to spend weeks or even months trying to answer. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of just my two cents on it. The other thing is resolution. Um, one of the, re and this might be more uh, of interest to Pete, but one of the reasons why I didn't really find much of a use in using this um, uh, spatial transcriptomics annotating tool in QPath was because the quote unquote um, high resolution image that is provided um, from the uh, Visium workflow as generated by Space Ranger, the tissue high res image is not high resolution as the name might suggest. I mean, it's about as high resolution as taking a photo with an old Nokia phone. Uh, <laughs> I can barely make out where a nucleus starts and ends. Um, and unsurprisingly, didn't do as good of a job on cell segmentation as I wanted to. But probably it's because I didn't specify the metadata, which is another issue. I'm not actually able to find any semblance of resolution in micron per pixels um, in this original image. Might be buried away somewhere under their, um, uh, their protocols or whatever, but at the end of the day, if I wanted to segment cells and I wanted to encode that information, I would use something like um, I would use something like ScanPy. Now I would open Spider and briefly show or SquidPy. Sorry, I would open Spider and briefly show that script. Unfortunately, I think the last project that I worked on had some patient metadata in that script, and. Uh, I'm just too lazy to edit my recording. So, you know, I guess I'll not open Spider. Um, yeah, so that was one of the reasons, like if I tried loading in a whole slide image, which I had to request specifically from the core facility that processed these images, um, the actual coordinates that are stored in the, um, what do you call it? Well, that like the coordinate file, um, I think it's called tissue position list. There's no information about what this number is. Is it microns? Is it pixels? Where's the point of origin? Um, and you know, if you use a completely different image with a completely different scale, those points are probably not going to line up. So. Yeah, um, SquidPy does have ways of basically computing the number of cells per spot, but you have to build a custom method for loading in and um, properly scaling the high, the original high resolution image, not the one part of the Visium workflow, but the one that you have to request from the core facility. Um, I was working on it briefly, but then I kind of just gave up out of boredom. Um, 
but it is possible and yeah you can kind of uh do whatever you want with that i mean you can run clustering based on the number of uh cells per spot uh if you wanted to um wonder if there's anything else i can quickly show uh squid pie squid pie Yeah, so I mean, the purposes of encoding histological information into your tissue section means you can actually run clustering, not in the gene expression space as shown on the left, but actually using image features. So now points of a cluster um, they might not share similar transcriptomic profiles, but they will share similar histological features. So the features that I generated here were things like just, you know, mean, red, green, and blue channel intensity in um, uh, within spots. And that was just a feature I kind of appended on in the data set. Um, our tissue sections aren't the best. So as you can see, there are some features that simply correlate with tissue processing artifacts like uh, folds or tears. Um, but yeah, so without making this video too long, and um, you know, I assume you guys don't wanna be sitting through this on a Friday night or Friday evening or afternoon actually, <laughs> all depends on your time zone. Um, I just want to make sure I've answered the question. So I believe I've answered that. If not, just send me another message and I'll try and answer this as best I can. Um, this also was my reason for why I didn't use um, Visium in QPath. And I mean, I love QPath like an adopted child, but um, it's just doesn't, I really don't see a potential for Visium in the future unless it becomes more mainstream or unless you have more people using it or the cost goes down. I think it costs somewhere like $10,000 per slide, like depending on your uh, sequencing depth. Um, so yeah. And if anyone's in, you know, Toronto, um, there's a user group meeting for 10X genomics people and I'll just be hanging around there. So feel free to say hi. <laughs> And anyways, on that note, uh, I'll wrap it up, upload it to YouTube, and uh, send this quick video that I promised uh, for Tuffle. All right, take care.